Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence event series brought to you by the Johns Hopkins University Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis and the Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features former CIA, CIA officer Scott Modell discussing Iran, the nuclear negotiations, political stability, and geopolitical risk. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's program will be, will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the MS in Intelligence Analysis playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the latter portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to the host of our program, Dr. Michael Ard. Thank you, Peter. Welcome everybody to our program today. So today we're talking about Iran. Where is US policy with Iran heading? Have we reached the point of no return on Iran's nuclear program? Has Tehran achieved hegemonic status in the Middle East? With us to discuss these topics today is Scott Modell. Scott is Managing Director and Head of Geopolitical Risk Service of the Rapidan Energy Group based in Washington, DC. Scott is a highly decorated CIA officer who served in the Middle East, Central Asia, and Latin America. He is also a non-resident fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a senior advisor to U.S. Special Operations Committee. He's very uh, well equipped to discuss this topic with us today. Thank you very much for being with us here, Scott. Mike, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Look forward to talking about Iran and uh, what, what better topic to discuss. There's probably a dozen issues about Iran every single day splashed across uh, uh, headlines all the time. So yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So what would, how, what, where to begin? Why don't we start with uh, talking a, a bit about what we see going on in Vienna over the talks. Will it be possible to revive in some form or fashion the, uh, the JCPOA? And, uh, and, and if so, what does that mean? And can, you know, can we get to a point of where both sides at least can tolerate each other enough to make it go forward. Well, thanks, thanks again for having me, Mike. It's a great question, the GCPOA. So they've been negotiating now for 17 months, seven, 16, 17 months. We've seen ups, we've seen downs in this process. Uh, you know, at, in our company, we have a variety of people who ask us these questions all the time from an oil market perspective. People are waiting to know the big single biggest geopolitical driver of risk in the Middle East right now from an oil markets perspective is Iran. Is there going to be a deal or not? Because if there is a revival of the JCPOA, you've got a million barrels a day of Iranian production coming back online at a time when spare, spare production capacity is, is down to uh, about 2 million barrels a day or so. And that's held almost entirely in Saudi in the, in, in the Emirates. So very, very little left in the tank for the for the set for OPEC plus to manage geopolitical volatility in the region. So the prospect of Iran coming back because of a deal is major, very bearish push downward pressure on US gasoline prices on global oil prices. So a lot of reasons why the Biden administration and why the world is watching very closely at the macroeconomic impacts, the regional stability impacts. Uh, not to mention U.S. Iran bilateral relations and all the other things that come uh, directly as a result of this deal. If there is not a deal, on the other hand, which I think if there is a market consensus out there now, and I would argue among experts too, there's a very healthy amount of skepticism that we're not going to get another deal. Mm -hmm. And you have different explanations that range from Iran is just dragging us along. Uh, you, the oil prices are high enough. Iran is getting enough oil out there. They're fine. They're so deeply offended and divided internally that they can't come to a decision uh, they're, that they're about to break out and go nuclear. I hear a lot of different explanations as to why we shouldn't expect a deal. And if we don't, if we don't get a deal, I'll say this. If we do not get a deal, and I would put up two near-term inflection points, the month of September, Unlike over the last year where we've seen some interesting declarations of deadlines, right? We've got to get a deal by this time. Jake Sullivan would say it. The Iranians would say it. The Europeans would say it. Now, I think you're starting to see a consensus around the idea that, you know, we've got an IAEA Board of Governors meeting coming. We have serious unresolved concerns. This has gone on long enough. 
the Europeans just gave their best and final draft, right? We've got a 35 page drafted deal. Uh, we've gone back and forth a million times, parsed every single word on this. Um, you've got the IEA 12 to 16 September uh, Board of Governors meetings. You've got the UN General Assembly meeting from 20 to 27 September. So the month of September really seems to be a point where worry they're going to have a deal and an agreement or heading toward an interim deal of some kind, right? That keeps this going, or we're not gonna have one. And again, I go to the bullish case. If we do not have a deal, uh, that's when you have real potential problems from an oil market perspective, from a regional stability perspective, not only are it, not only would it put up a lot of upward pressure on, on uh, oil prices, but again, people will start to say, this risk that we've seen of Israel, covert action, outright war, building an anti-Iran coalition in the region, all of this stuff starts to go, the, these risks start to, to, to compound. And you really, really are going to get two, so it's a very big bi-directional risk. So we're talking about Iran at a time when the deal could go, could break in either direction. And I, and, I, and I would say right now, if you ask me, are we going to get a deal? Here's the readout that I've gotten. I'll just tell you this, in the last 24 hours, the Iranian nuclear team has returned uh, from Vienna, they went back to, everyone's adjourned, they went back to the respective capitals. The Iranians are there, they're briefing parliament, they're briefing their Supreme Council for National Security, and they're talking about this latest draft. We haven't seen anything to suggest from inside of Iran that they're ready to embrace this last version, but I think it speaks to the challenges here of Iran itself coming to any type of a decision uh, you know, with regard to the revival of the JCPOA, partially because uh, they feel so wronged about what happened. When, when President Trump backed out of the deal in 2018, they said, you know, we were abiding by the deal. We were doing everything right. And now we're going to get into a deal. Biden could be here for a couple more years. But what happens once he's gone? Are we going to have to go through this same problem again? And nobody's sort of made amends. Nobody's paid us reparations for the lost opportunities along the way. So there's a lot of, there's a heavy internal debate based on traditional distrust, traditional anti-American themes inside of Iran. Nobody wants to look weak and nobody wants to own this. And you have an Iranian president who a year in to his first uh, term uh, isn't looking very good, right? Hasn't saw, hasn't fulfilled any of his, of his pledges. Iran dissent is high, inflation is high, all the macroeconomic indicators inside of Iran are bad, not getting worse. Internal dissension is there, it's under control. They're not on the verge of a uh, regime change or a state collapse. But again, um, things take a turn for the worse and all of a sudden they've got large violent nationwide protests again. So nobody wants to, it's still controversial enough inside of Iran that nobody wants to own this deal yet. It has to be a clear, um, concession, uh, series of concessions to Iran. Iran has had to make concessions on the, the foreign terrorist organization designation related to the IRGC. Iran has had to concede that there's no way Joe Biden or any U.S. president can give guarantees about what the successor presidents will do about abrogating the agreement or staying in it. So Iran has become more pragmatic over time in retracting some of its core demands, but there are still more concessions, more sanctions you can demand there are still other guarantees you can ask for. So here we are, and I think we've gotten to a point where we're at the latest impasse over this possible military dimensions of Iran's program. Past indications of uh, weaponization activities, uranium enrichment that the Iranian government hadn't declared, the sites that were undeclared. And now the IAEA is saying, we've got to clear this up. Iran is saying, no, we don't. Now in 2015, we signed the JCPOA, the original nuclear deal, um, brushing under the rug these same uh, possible military dimensions of the program. They're old, they're outdated. But, um, Scott, President, can I interrupt for a second? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead. That, I think their argument was, look, you don't have a right to look at our military program, right? The IAEA has no, doesn't, have the, doesn't have the remit to go and look at the military side of the program, if there were such a thing. That's right. And I think this the reason why this might be slightly different, there's there, that logic is still there, Mike. And I think they're saying there are military bases and activities and sensitive things that you have no business looking into. Right. And we, <clears throat> excuse me. And we still stand by that. There are also there's also the issue of non-military bases where there have been undeclared activities 
uh, particles found and so forth. So the IEA is just saying, let's resolve this. Let's find it. And, and I personally think we are going to get past this. I don't think the Iranians are going to let this stand in the way of the deal. So right now, gun to my head, if you ask me, is there going to be a deal? Uh, I say we have a few more iterations of brinkmanship to get through, but I think that we will get some form of a deal, either a full revival of the JCPOA, and there are reasons for that. I think on the Iranian side in particular, you get strong economic incentives to do that, um, or an interim deal that uh, is, is something a little bit less, some sanctions easing, waivers again in exchange for uh, some small-scale implementation, getting back into compliance with the original deal. You know, and... To go back to where we were, right, to go back to 2015, you know, there's a lot of genie that would be happy, you'd have to put back into the bottle at this point. They, they have a lot more enriched uranium than they did back then. They have a lot more centrifuges in operation. I mean, it's just a much bigger program to curtail now, right? than it was back seven years ago. It's a much bigger program to curtail. And the interesting thing now is we always talk about Iran's dreaded fear isn't sort of, it's US sanctions are bad enough. The reimposition though, the potential reimposition of UN sanctions, if the UN Security Council meets and they say, listen, Iran is just obfuscating here. They don't really want to deal. It's time to, it's long overdue now to reimpose UN sanctions. And the, and the Europeans can do that without Russia and China. However, <clears throat> um, I, you know, I, I think the snapback of UN sanctions is one thing. It's been a disincentive for Iran <clears throat> to, to continue to be outside the deal. But Iran has changed things. To your point, Mike, the Iranian nuclear program is very different than it was back then. And now these guys are looking inside of Iran at their own snapback uh, sort of potential. We, if you guys decide to renege on the deal again or abrogate the deal, if the U.S. withdraws, if a President DeSantis or a President Trump in 2000, January 2025 takes office after Biden leaves and says, we are leaving the deal again, fine. We, Iran, now have a much more robust program. We are going to snap back into place those same things that kept you up at night, advanced centrifuges, higher levels of enrichment, weaponization activities, turning off cameras, all of this nuclear leverage will be snapped back quickly. And I think that's when we talk about guarantees that Iran is continuing to talk about. Yes, they want guarantees that they can economically benefit from the deal, of course. They want guarantees that the U.S. isn't going to withdraw. But, but recognizing that the U.S. very, uh, very uh, there's a good chance that they will withdraw, um, they say, fine, we're going to have our own guarantees in place. And that is to go right back to uh, August of 2022 where everybody was nervous about us being on the cusp of nuclear weaponization. There's, uh, and that, you know, just going back to that, and I think that's really interesting. I mean, first of all, if one does, you know, if you want to research this topic a little bit, uh, you know, I was trying to read up beforehand, and you can go back and you could read articles from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that say Iran is right on the cusp. You know, and that and that, that's been this has been something we've been dealing with for only well 20, 25 years, right? I mean, Iran is about ready to break up, but really, really seems it much more relevant now, right? When you have uh you have near weapons grade uranium enrichment, which they haven't had before, and you you have a lot more capacity than they had before. But at the same time, where I guess it, I'm leading into a question here, which is how do you gauge their level of um, interest or um, desire to get a deal done now as compared to say 2014, 2015 when uh, Rouhani was president? I think that um, the deal is the, the desire, there's, there's there, the fundamental logic that's driving the Iranians to, to have you know, multiple rounds of talks with us today uh, and to be there and engage in trying to get a deal. The logic is the same today as it was then. They need a deal then, they needed, they, they, and they still need a deal today. However, the difference, I think, is there you had much stronger international coalition that was pushing against Iran at the time. I think, you, like to your point, the Iranian nuclear program wasn't nearly as advanced. And you know what? Listen, there's something to be said about recent history. When you violate, when, when you actually break up this deal, and, and repeatedly uh, show Iran that any international agreement that you enter into 
uh, is questionable. It may, it, it may, and, and you know, even if you do in good faith, we're still going to sanction you. Forget about the reasons if that's right or wrong or who's right in, in doing that. The Iran, it's taken an impact on the Iranian psyche and the Iranian psyche among the people that among the unelected real centers of power there is to sort of to underscore the, 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 the place where they've been for a very long time, which is we can't trust the United States. We should constantly be thinking of ways of circumventing sanctions, circumventing the United States. And you know what? These recent historical examples really matter. So back then, I think that they had that skepticism. There was still that those ideological underpinnings, anti-US, you know, cautious toward the West underpinnings in their thinking. But now it's much worse. And I think what you're dealing with now also is a place where in 2022, we're much closer to a transition, the succession of the Supreme Leader. And Iran has a very, very unpredictable transition coming up. Unpredictable because you've got wild uh, variances of analysis as to what is going to happen when the Supreme Leader uh, passes away. When he's gone, what does that transition look like? And if you, you could argue that there is no transition more important or there hasn't been one in the last 50 years in the Middle East than this one, you know? And I, I think there's a lot of unpredictability to it. You have a volatile underbelly where you've got disparate protest movements in Iran, all of which are opposed to the status quo, to the regime. Are we at the point of seeing, you know, a violent overthrow of the Islamic Republic? No, but I think they have a very ill-defined way forward. I mean, they have in their constitution the way it should be discussed and negotiated, and but. I think there's a, there's an unwritten part about it. I think there's a need to build consensus in Iran that hasn't happened yet. And you've got a much more mature Islamic Republic where you have real divisions there among the conservative, uh, you know, among conservative camps in that country. So at, at, that's why I think Iran is in a very different place and, than they were back then. And um, so, so I think, again, the logic prevails, Mike, they still need a deal. And I think when you look at them thinking about heading into this big transition, um, the more money that they have in the coffers, the more stability that they have, the more inflation that they can stab off, the more that they can do uh, to, to figure out ways of getting away from this dependence on the international financial system as it stands, circumventing sanctions, minimizing the impact of sanctions, realizing that they're in this perpetual cycle of, of on again, off again relations with the United States. Um, it's getting harder and harder, and especially at a time when they're not prepared for this big internal transition. We can talk about the internal transition. I've got a lot to say about that if you want to get into that. But, but I, I think it's it's definitely a different time than, today than it was then. Let's get into that because I think that's a very important topic. I mean, especially since uh, uh, the Supreme Leader is 82, and um, there's a uh, uh, they've only had two Supreme Leaders, <laughs> and one obviously could do whatever he wanted in terms of succession. That was the stature he had. Are we, how will, how will the next uh, Supreme Leader of Iran be chosen? You know, there's, a, there's, an, there's an assembly of experts and, there's, and, and there's, a, there's an internal structure and apparatus for figuring out one, how to choose that person, how to, how to shape, shape that debate and, and how to elect the next Supreme Leader. But you know there are differing opinions on how the Iranians are ultimately going to see that process through. There are differing differing opinions on the extent to which existing uh, centers of power are already trying to shape that debate, trying to actually put their people within the this 82 member assembly of experts that will eventually be the ones that that give the the, the final approval, the final sign off on this. So there is jockeying for power in conservative circles. There is a large. There has been for the last several years a large nationwide purge going on of, of, of people that, uh, you know, if you're not aligned with this group in the Office of the Supreme Leader or that group in the IRGC, uh, they're pushing you out, you're being sidelined. So there is a very serious competition going on across the government within the conservative establishment. This isn't just about pushing out reformers, pushing out people that look like they're too close to the West. This is about tightening up, shoring up power within the establishment that supports the regime, that supports continuity of the regime. So Mike, the answer is, I'll tell you what, I talked to so many people who are really real experts on Iran, who follow this passionately and intimately and have great sources inside of Iran and, and follow this debate about succession. And most people end up scratching their heads. They talk about, well, it could be Raisi. Raisi was supposed to, President Raisi was being groomed. 
But then again, he's done such a terrible job. He doesn't, he's not charismatic. He's not smart. He doesn't have popular support in, inside of Iran. He's being set up to fail because of his presidency. Um, and he won't be, a, and then I hear others saying other things. So I think it's very unpredictable, which speaks to the fact that this unpredictability comes at a time when this is a major, major transition for Iran, not to have something lined up, ready to go, visible, so that people understand what it is, people inside of Iran even, I think is very dangerous. And uh, it suggests that we've got very turbulent times ahead in terms of Iranian internal politics, but that this internal, this unpredictability surrounding the succession process is part of the reason why we're seeing the inability to make clear streamlined decisions with regard to nuclear talks and so forth. A lot, a lot of uh, you know, commentary on Iran is often um, somewhat optimistic that there'd be uh, some type of, type of an internal regime change or or that um, there'd be, uh, you know, that you know, there'd be more like a popular, you know, popular pressure to make these changes. But it seems always that Iran uh, uh, denies the critics. You know, they always seem like the regime always ends up looking, ends up like after 2009, ends up looking a lot stronger than the people thought. You know, it's a great point. You know, I remember, you know, back in, you know, when I was still in the agency and we were tracking these things from the inside and we, we would, we, listen, we had a checklist and Department of Defense had a checklist, CIA had a checklist, DI had a checklist. I'm sure foreign uh, intelligence services and, and diplomats were looking at the same thing, but a basic checklist of what would be the, the, the key indicators, if you will, of regime change, be it Iran, be it China, be it Vladimir Putin in Russia. And when we went and looked at those and check those boxes. If you had 10 big leading indicators, is there a charismatic opposition leader? Are people willing to, to, to engage in protests, use violence against the regime? Is there elite support for opposition to the existing government? A number of different factors. When you compare the way the yes or no's lined up between 1979 and the run-up to the Islamic revolution in 79 versus 2009 or versus 2022, there's no comparison. Uh, so that's why we keep coming back to, yes, there are fundamental flaws in the, in the foundation of the regime. Yes, there's, there are reasons why we're going to continue to see volatility, instability, anti-regime protests, problems, talk of regime change, talk of regime collapse. But it hasn't reached the point where it's going to topple over. It's going to tip over. You still have, a, you know, across the spectrum, despite this ongoing purge that I mentioned within the IRGC, within the MOIS, within the Office of the Supreme Leader, you still have a, um, it's not monolithic, but for the moment, when it comes to suppressing, re, you know, repressing uh, anti-Western elements in the government, when it comes to opposing the United States, across the board, um, they, they, they're, they're pretty unified in that when it comes to implementing government orders. So I don't see very much of, a, I don't see a much of a chance or an increasing chance of regime change. I think the Iranian regime, it's interesting. The one thing I would say differently is this. I remember when we were looking at 2009, the Green Movement happens, and all of a sudden, uh, you've got Mousavi and Kadabi, and they're out there, and this movement got you know millions of people pouring into the street, and it, it's, they weren't even calling for regime change. But in the aftermath of that, uh, and in the aftermath of 2017 and 19 protests, very large protests that actually spanned much more of the Iranian demographic than the 2009 protests, where you had urban poor and rural poor and people that traditionally fell in line, right, or just that weren't that activist out in the streets. Um, the after action reports from the from within the Iranian intelligence services always suggested that, you know what, we we had control over the major cities, right, but we weren't too far Right. You could envision a, a point where if these protests had reached 50 more cities or if there had been a thousand to, you know, 2000 instead of a thousand protesters in each of those major cities, we would have started we would have started to face real threats of being overrun in certain places. They weren't they weren't concluding that the, the regime was totally in, in, you know, about to fall. But 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 they take a, they watch this stuff, Mike, very carefully, very closely. But these lessons in 2009, 17 and 19 have led them to come up with, and it's it's an imperfect, and we can talk about the imperfections of Iran's approach to in, you know, its own problems inside and externally, but it, it did lead them to, to, to say, we need a whole of government approach here in Iran to figuring out suppression, keeping back you know, so the, the, the elements of change, 
the, the ones who would thwart the, the Islam Republic in the system, the protest movement, all of that, they've done a better job of it. They've gotten smarter. And you talk about the U.S., I mean, it's, it's just divert for a second. When a year ago, we heard about this Iran-China 25-year agreement, right? What does that really mean? And people started scrambling. They said, wait a minute, what does that mean? What does China think? One of the top items on the list, uh, I guess the wish list from Iran to China was, we would love to have uh, massive surveillance systems, camera systems, you know, mm -hmm. in all the major cities, similar to what you have. Let's collaborate on things like that. So the Iranians realize what they need to get better at monitoring uh, protest movements, keeping you know the protesters back, co regime continuity. Um, but so so I would say we're not at the point of, of regime collapse. Uh, the, all of those flaws are still there, but they do a pretty good job to your point of keeping things intact. One thing that I, I think, one of the things that has come up, uh, especially in the last few years is, um, Though, though a police state, right, how vulnerable they seem to be from an external penetration, especially from intelligence services from other countries, and to the point where uh, sabotage, assassinations, I mean, uh, and even, even reactions on their part that look like panic. And that, that's one of the things I find, which is an interesting paradox about this, is that um, is that they seem very vulnerable in the last several years. They do seem vulnerable. And I'll say this, I, I think that vulnerability has increased over time. And mm -hmm. I can, without getting into too much detail, I can tell you that, you know, it, it, as of, we'll, we'll call it 2009, 10, and, and before, it, Mossad, CIA, other intelligence services that were interested in penetrating the Iranian government, they had their fair share of sources. They had willing participants within the Iranian army or within the IRG, even within the IRGC and in real sensitive areas of, you know, pro-regime centers of power. Um, but they're, they're still outliers. They're still the minority. Finding good sources that are willing to help the United States or other Iranian enemies thwart the system. It's one thing to actually have people stand up and say, hey, I'm willing to provide you with intelligence to debrief you on this or to tell you what my particular agency is doing that or give you my thoughts. But it's a whole other thing to be involved in, a, in, in assisting covert action, abetting covert action. Those, are, those people are hard to come by, but they're there. I think between 2010 and today, the number of those people has only increased. That doesn't mean, again, that you've got uh, an, an army or an IRGC that's ready to actually get involved in a coup against the regime. But I think you have a lot of dissatisfaction. And when you and I think it's important to recognize, stand back and you look at the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard is not one monolithic pro-regime entity. There's people who don't care about anything about the politics who are just there to make money. There are other groups that are very ideological and hard charging and there to ensure the regime lasts no matter what. And then there are just the bureaucrats, technocrats. And a lot of that middle group is really dissatisfied and they're willing to actually, uh, and they're not seeing the benefits that the small corrupt elite most ideological are. So I think those are there. There are a lot of people that are willing to help. Mike, you've seen Israel over the last two years or so you've seen dozens of attacks inside of Iran, inside of Iran. It's yeah. shifted. It was, it, for a while, it was the gloves were off, hitting Iran at will inside Syria, maybe in Iraq on occasion um, and other places, but not inside of Iran. In Iran proper now, everything is fair game. Israel's made that clear. And I think while the, while the, Iran, while the U.S. has been a lot more cautious and remains cautious, especially with this administration and the ongoing talks, uh, I think the moment we have a strong indication that the talks are done, I think you're going to see a, you, there's a real danger of lurching into a place where this covert action ramps up. And I, again, I think Israel has shown they've got plenty of options to continue to cause havoc and create problems for the Iranians on the inside. Uh, one can only imagine that you were being how what a earthquake it must have been to have the Iran chief scientist. Uh, assassinated in broad daylight in an armed motorcade uh, remotely. For that to happen, I mean, this, here's here's somebody who was was in obscurity successfully for decades. He was the mastermind behind this program. Uh, had had it was you know single handedly behind it. The most sought after scientist in Iran for decades, and all of a sudden he's gone. I think it was devastating to them. But I think as devastating it was, and I, and I just want to say this. 
as devastating as that was, as devastating as, as the killing of Soleimani was, uh, as devastating as Olympic Games was, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the operation that's gone public about uh, you know, putting um, Stuxnet in the in Iranian centrifuges and causing those temporary delays or slowdowns of centrifuge activity. As, de as impressive as all of that was, and as demoralizing it might, as it might have been for Iranian security services and counterintelligence, they were blips. They recover and move on and they learn from it. Their industrial security gets better. Their cybersecurity gets better. Their defensive measures get better. Their counterespionage gets better. Over time, they have setbacks, but they, it's not like they're not learning from these setbacks. So mm -hmm. as imperfect as the regime is, there still is an ongoing process of you know, one step back, step forward or two and, uh, and learning as they go. But yeah, definitely. And it, but it also goes to show they're not single threaded. You take away Soleimani, He's not, he doesn't make or break the entire Quds Force, uh, op, you know, operational, you know, uh, milieu overseas. And neither did Fakhrizadeh on the nuclear side. So, you know, they've invested a lot. And one of the points people are making now is, the, to your earlier point, the Iranian program, nuclear program, has advanced to a different place now. They have a lot of know-how. The know-how that isn't going away. Kill one scientist or kill another one. You know, reduce the amount of centrifuges they have. Put them in storage. Do what you want and call it containment. They've advanced to the place where they've got more industrial knowledge than they had before. And again, if you want, if you want to actually break the agreement, you're going to have to deal with an, with an Iranian government that is going to be much more proficient when it comes to rebuilding that program in a, in a threatening way. Uh, folks, uh, we're at about uh, halfway mark, but so please uh, offer your questions in the Q and A or the chat, and we will, we will get to them. But I wanted to, before we do, touch on. Uh, a topic that uh, Scott and I were discussing before we came on, which is Iran and the and its position in the rest of the region. Um, on paper, we you know Iran looks, is very impressive. In fact, has increased a lot of its influence in the region, uh, especially since uh, uh, the Yemen War started um, about what is it now seven eight years ago. But uh, what where how do we assess this now? How do we look at where Iran's uh, uh, position in the regions? Is it a position of strength? You know, it's, I, I, we were talking about this before. I, I've long thought that they're the best of the worst in terms of projecting regional power. I think there's so many flaws. You, you can find fail, so many failures when you look at Iran's attempts to project power in the region that leads to a sustainable base of either op military operations or political influence that uh, supports the idea that you know, Iran should be a center of power or should be even hegemonic in the region, or Iran is a model to follow. A lot of it is haphazard, a lot of it is fleeting, and a lot of it is just creating chaos that may look like it's Iran leaning. So, I mean, look at Lebanon today. Like you, you, Iran might, you, if you're Iranian and you're rationalizing, you know, the spending of billions of dollars over 40 years for Lebanese Hezbollah, you're gonna say they went from nothing in, in the early eighties or almost nothing, to some work to arguably the most powerful bloc in the country today. Never, you know, notwithstanding the the political chaos that they're in, notwithstanding the fact that it looks like a failed state in many ways. So the Iranians have ways of rationalizing, and the Supreme Leader often says, "Why should we sit around and 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 not do anything in the region? Why should we do that? We derive strategic influence because of that power, because of that we're not going to correct all the ills of the region, but we would rather actually try to remake the region in our in our out of our image, just like the Saudis are trying to do. They'll just they, the, that's another thing they'll say. They'll say if we don't do it, well then the Saudis are going to step in, and and now they're saying that more than ever. They're saying, listen, now that the U.S. is backing out, which by the way is the result of our aggressive approach to the region. That's what the Iranians say. They're justifying four decades of aggressively pushing in Yemen, aggressively pushing in Syria and elsewhere as the reason or one of the main reasons why President Trump and arguably President Biden and Obama before him when they wanted to pivot to Asia have said enough is enough in this region. And, and it, let's, let's move on to Asia. Let's get out of this place where we can't win. It's this endless cycle of violence. And oh, by the way, the, the Saudis and the Emiratis are now stepping in to say, yeah, you're right. The U.S. is going to have a less of a role and we're going to step in and do take more take 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 more of a role in regional security. Um, the Iranians are saying that all is a result of the success of our efforts, as flawed as they may be in the minds of, of, of myself, for instance. So I think, Mike, I would say going, you know, if you look at um, places like Yemen, Yemen for the Iranians, when it started in 2014, 
they said the Saudis are going to go into this. And I remember Soleimani talking about this. Soleimani was talking about, he said, this is going to be their Vietnam. Just sit back and watch. And we're more than happy to, 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 to actually make that happen, to help that. And it's not like, you know, Hezbollah and the Houthis are the same. And people talk about, well, how much is Iran related to the Houthis and how much do they control them? Even if they don't need to control them that much. There's the provision of rockets and expertise and intelligence and moral support and everything and money and other things. And look what it's done. Look what it has done. We've, we've got a ceasefire now that's hanging on by a thread. We've got a few extensions and that's all good news. I don't want to pour cold water on that. But, but again, it's still a very tenuous situation, mainly because you have the Houthis after eight years who are convinced we're not going to lose this thing. We're actually in a good place. We're more than, we're more than willing to actually do a ceasefire. But we think that we need to be part of the permanent solution. Others like the Saudis and other Yemeni actors haven't fully accepted that. So I think that there's something that, you know, in, where, where the Iranians look at, at Yemen and they say, that's a real success for us. That's real leverage against one of our biggest rivals in the region, Saudi Arabia. So I, that for me is an example of a relatively inexpensive way of using this asymmetric power projection the Iranians do, which again, like I said, fails in a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, in a successful way. It was a light touch. Uh, and no, it hasn't created a stable Yemeni state, but I'm not sure that that was the Iran, the Iran's goal from the, from the beginning. But regionally speaking, when I, when I sit back, I don't see, you know, I see the same internal Iranian themes. When, you, when they talk about anti-Supreme Leader, anti-regime, um, why are we spending so much money in Lebanon and Iraq? Why don't we focus here? Um, it hasn't stopped the Iranians from doing that. I think that they are hardwired to externalize the Islamic revolution, as Khomeini used to put it. They're going to continue to do that stuff, partially because they see no alternative to it. They've invested a lot in it. And, and look at Iraq. You look at Iraq right now, it's another example. Um, you could argue that the, 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 pop, the, 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 the uh, uh, militia forces, the PMFs, uh, the Shiite militia forces are the, strong, the strongest single military force in the country. When you look at the coordination framework, when you look at pro-Iran political actors in Baghdad, all of it points to imperfection, chaos, dysfunctionality, and inability of Iraq to come together and, and deal with its own affairs, right? Deal with corruption, deal with inefficiency, form of government, do basic things. But the Iranians don't want to turn Iraq into a perfect functioning state. The Iranians say, We'd rather have the U.S. gone. We'd rather have the most influence, relative more influence than everybody else. And we're doing a pretty good job of that. And uh, are they going to stop the implosion there? Are they going to fix everything? I don't think that's ever been their objective, quite frankly. So if you look at it from the, 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 the objective of how would the U.S. consider a success in Iraq or Lebanon, I think the Iranians have a very different view of that. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they took an enemy off the, totally off the table. Right. I mean, you know, that, and, and they have a tremendous amount of influence over, uh, uh, as you said, I mean, the, over 60% of the population, how the government's formed. I mean, it's just, uh, it's a mission kill. And, it, you is, know, I think it is. And when you look at, when, when you, you know, again, Syria, Syria is far from out of the woods. Syria is going to have problems for decades, rebuilding, reconstructing. Who's going to pay for all of that? How is that? How is Syria going to evolve and improve? Is there going to be a is there going to be a Gulf Arab role in that? I, maybe I guess. But in the meantime, the Iranians have done a lot of grand, important groundwork, building foundations, infrastructure, long term relationships, long term small localized centers of power throughout that country, along with the Russians and others. That it may not last forever, but it's, it looks a much stronger than anything the, the the Saudis or the Emiratis will have anytime soon. And again. The Iranians are thinking year by year. This isn't, they, they know there's no guarantees that the Islamic Republic's going to be here for another thousand years. These guys are fighting every single year, internally and externally. So Syria for them is, 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 is a success in a lot of ways. Oh, I mean, right. I mean, so you kept your, you kept your client in power. Uh, you know, you have, he's holding on to a, you know, rump Syria, but the stuff that was mostly important, and they'll probably get the oil fields back sooner or later. It's, you know, it doesn't seem like a failure, <laughs> but I mean, it certainly, um, uh, it's, it probably will be a drain in resources for years to come. Well, I would say too, <clears throat> Mike, I would say the interesting thing from, going, you know, taking a CIA perspective on this for a second. So if I were going into the CIA today, I, I think I got to say, it's always fascinating in the agency to be focused on things like Iran and Russia and China always. But when you look at the, the uncertainty that's hovering over all the dynamics across the region, tectonic shifts like the Abraham Accords, 
you know, real relationships changing and evolving in ways that are going to force us to change strategic collection objectives, force, to, force us to look at intelligence collection in a different way, just on Iran alone. The closer we get to succession, I mean, as hard as it is to collect on something like that in a clandestine manner, um, we're going to have to figure it out. And I think it's a point where it's going to demand a lot more operational creativity in the human intelligence space. And I think when you look at if this Abra if the Abraham Accord sticks, and I, I don't I think it will, uh, and the Saudis eventually join it in some fashion, uh, I, and you still have this Iran Gulf rivalry, and the U.S. is withdrawing to some degree, I, I think that that makes it a fascinating time to be getting into the intelligence business. And again, it's one it's one something that suggests to me that as much as we want to pivot to Asia, and, and I think there's good reason given China and so forth, that um, you know, realities on the ground, Afghanistan is a great example, for, you know, dictate that we won't be able to leave. And we need to start thinking very creatively about what kind of leave behind collection apparatus we're going to want to have as we try to shape things that are, you know, very much uh, things we haven't seen before. Um, let's get to a few questions now. Um, von Clausewitz asks, would you be able to provide a precise checklist, such as, such as it is, of factors that would account for evaluating a potential regime change. So when we think about our checklist on that, or, or uh, sure. we'll, I mean, not, I don't know, nobody has a, a formula for, for this or, but uh, what do you think? First of all, I think one of the most important things is you have to have a movement inside the country where you've lowered the threshold to enough of a degree where you can have massive participation in, in civil resistance. There has to be, you know, civil disobedience on a large scale. You can't expect every regime change, right, to rely on uh, a, a small group of guerrillas in the mountains who are going to come in, descend on Tehran, replace the government, and start over. Just history just shows that most most transitions don't work when they, when you try to do those things. And Iran is a case in point. The revolution did, in '79 did not happen because of that. It was the nonviolent part where you had mass participation on a larger scale, civil disobedience strikes labor movements. It wasn't the, the, the Fed Aim movement, the guerrilla movement that started in the 60s uh, in, in Iran didn't work. And uh, it, was, it was effectively suppressed by Savak and the Iranians. So I think that's one thing you need to have. And we don't see that. You see, you, see, you see disparate movements, but they haven't coalesced into one single nationwide movement. You see it on occasion. You've seen people protests uh, in, in multiple cities at the same time, but it hasn't been sustainable. I think that's one thing you need to see sustained participation across the, uh, the, the entirety of Iranian society in a nonviolent way that that uh, that that actually leads to um, sections of the Iranian government joining in. You also, but that goes to the second point. You need to see there has to be support from within the Iranian elites and within the existing Iranian government a willingness to actually um, to to not carry out orders, to depart from the government, to go its own way. Um, and to not suppress protesters, we haven't seen that. That's the next thing. Three, you need to have, Iranians or any, anybody for that matter, they need to have somebody to rally behind, right? In 2009, it was Mousavi, the former prime minister uh, who was running for president. Uh, he wasn't there to lead a revolution against the Islamic Republic. Things got out of control. He, pre, you know, he was, informed, he was in, in favor of reforming the Islamic Republic, not overthrowing it. Mm -hmm. There is no charismatic opposition leader. You have to have one. We don't have one. Um, economic downturn has to be severe economic downturn to get people motivated to go out in the streets to protest to take actions. You could argue that there are economic incentives uh, that, that motivate Iranians to hate the regime, to act against it. Um, and I think that's one of the key drivers. That's one of the key checks that we have. Their economy is bad. It's not getting and it's getting worse. Um, it's gotten there's been a slight respite because of high oil prices and because of relatively weak sanction enforcement on the part of the Biden administration on Iranian oil and China willing to buy you know, a million barrels a day of Iranian oil. But um, for the most part, I, I think the, the lack of opportunity, high unemployment, high inflation, uh, budgetary problems, su subsidy reforms that, that make things more expensive, food subsidies, food prices, all of these are things that actually lend to uh, you know, unrest and the possibility of regime change or at least the driver of regime change in Iran. And there are a few other things like that, but those are, I mean, I think everybody's got a list of their, their favorite 10 or so. Those are the ones, external support. Is there strong external support? A lot of times, I mean, is the US or, or a foreign 
uh, a foreign state ally saying, you know what, we're going to fund the green movement or some other movement. Mm -hmm. We're going to provide them with weapons or money or ideology or propaganda or public support. The green movement in 2009, uh, for those who remember it, um, was out there and they were reaching out to the United States government openly and quietly and saying, what can you do for us here? We need some help. We need some help. Could President Obama go out and say some positive things about Musavi or about the green movement or about democracy, about human rights, about anything? But then, of course, that was undermined, as we know, as there was messaging and, sec and uh, track two and uh, messaging between the Supreme Leader and the, and the White House that forced us to keep some distance between the protests and movements. But an external source of supply, even if it's just rhetorical, is really important as well. So those are, those are just a few of the things that I would say are worth, are worth considering. Yeah, that's a great list. You know, you think about Iran's history a little bit too, um, legitimacy, right? There's a, li the, like, you know, you think of regime legitimacy, are, are people, enough people still buying in? And, um, uh, you know, we, we think back to 1953 and what, and then, you know, I mean, uh, which, uh, or 1978, 79. And um, I think, Back uh, criticism of the CIA back in '79 was that uh, oh we didn't we thought that the Shah would be a tough guy and what and and he wasn't and, and he or he wasn't tough he wasn't tough to the point where we thought he could he could crack down on on his on uh, regime dissidents and get away with it. Well, um, a, you bring up an important point in 2000 when the Green Movement first started, yeah, and and and, and all of a sudden you see millions of people out in the streets. The regime's initial reaction was, like previous protests in the 90s and early 2000s, a couple of times, these are going to come, stay for 72 hours or so, and they're going to they dissipate. And when they didn't, and they started, it was a month or two months and three months, I remember the Supreme Leader called the meeting, and he said, okay, clear out of being prison, clear the decks, we need a, you know, a government-wide approach to, to dealing with this. Why? Because in the late 70s, if the Shah had done what we need to do now, which is to really get tough and crack down. If the Shah had cracked down on us, this clerical movement inside of Iran, we wouldn't be here today. But he didn't do that. He did. And he was too soft on us. We can't make that same mistake. So you saw there was a brutal repression of the Green Movement. And ever since then, they've applied that same thinking, you know, when it comes to these, these movements that bubble up. That doesn't mean the movements are going to stop. There aren't going to be more violent anti-regime protests, but but they recognize it would be a mistake just to sit back and let these things peter out. Right. Do they have the will? You know that that seemed like that seemed like a big question mark with uh, Assad, right? I mean, did he would he have the will to persevere uh, through the type of um, uh, unprecedented protests that he was facing? And he and he surprised people with with the amount of uh, frankly um, stubbornness that he did in dealing with it. I think he surprised people, and I think he had a willing participant in uh, in executing that with uh, yes. Solon. You know, with the Iranians, the Iranians came in right. and said, you know, let's roll up our sleeves, take the gloves off. We can't be bashful about this stuff. You've got a real problem on your hands. And for you to keep this going, we need to uh, we need to be tough and we need to take a different approach. And you saw what happened. Great. Let me uh, let, get, get to another question. Sure. Uh, this is an interesting one uh, regarding how does Russia see these talks now? I mean, it, with uh, on the on the new uh, potential, new, a new potential nuclear deal. Um, would Russia see uh, be uh, favorable toward it? In the past, it was certainly favorable, at least to the idea of them not getting the bomb. But maybe things have changed a lot since uh, February of this year. It's a great question. It's a great question. And it, it's when you look at the reasons, when you ask yourself, wait a minute, on before the Ukraine invasion, February 23rd, uh, Russia was being pretty helpful in this process. They were helping draft the Iranian retorts, and they were trying to bring Iran and the U.S. closer. And Ulyanov, the, the, the Russian representative, was, was outwardly positive about it and, and, and talking about, we're getting closer to agreement and we're moving in the right direction with Russia's help. So I would say there was something very real uh, uh, you know, earlier in the year about Russia playing a constructive role in this process. Um, you know, I think in the past they've been accused of being underminers, former, for, you know, the, the former Iranian foreign minister, Zarif, said that in the run-up to the JCPOA, the Russians, you know, were actually trying to be, uh, you know, undermine the agreement. But, but in the end, they didn't stop it. And I think now what you're seeing, though, is after the Ukraine invasion, the Russia has changed. And, uh, you know, 
are they actively lobbying the Iranians to play hardball and to delay and and uh, to not do a deal? I think there's some of that going on. And, and I would point to, the, to what I continuously hear. I hear a lot of people who are cl cl closely track some of the conservative elements of the regime, like the Office of the Supreme Leader and others, who over the years have developed a really close relationship with Moscow. And Russia's security services have done a pretty good job of burrowing into that, that, that sort of ultra-nationalist, hardline part of the Iranian regime, partially because of corruption, partially because it's enemy of my enemy sort of thing against the United States. But there's real, there's some real solidarity when it comes to, to, to certain issues like that, that are based around the idea of we've got to work together against the United States, we've got to work together to circumvent sanctions, we've got to work together to create new centers of power in the world. They, they see eye to eye in some ways in that sense. I don't think the Russians are, are threatening the Iranians to not do a deal, but I, I don't think that they're willing participants in the, in the way that they were until very recently. So the role of Russia shouldn't be un underestimated. I think they have an influence on Iranian thinking, especially given what most people point to as the inability of Iran to come together in a nice clean way to build a consensus around something as important as a nuclear deal. The Russians are there antagonizing the hardline elements to delay and to ask for more concessions. And it, and it ends up causing problems. So it worked, it cuts both ways. And I think, but I think at the same time, I'm trying to be realistic because as much as that sounds like Russia's almost got control over Iran to some degree, I think there's a healthy amount of distrust between the two, particularly Iran toward Russia. Uh, so I, I think there's a balance there. And I think there's a plenty of voices inside of Iran who are saying, you know what? Yes, we may be tilting east toward Russia and China to some degree, uh, but we need to remember getting a deal and being involved with Europe and the mainstream economy uh, makes a lot of sense for the Iranians. And we can't have all our, all our uh, eggs in, that, in those baskets. Okay, a few more questions. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for everybody's participation. Um, here's one, and uh, I perhaps uh, don't know the reference on this, Scott, maybe you do. Yeah. Uh, will any of this recent news about the IRG, I think this means IRGC, and John Bolton changed the JCPOA calculus. Do you know what he's referring to there? Um, John Bolton, IRGC. I mean, unless we're talking about, I mean, I know that there are ongoing um, threats against former officials. Yes. Uh, like Mike Pompeo and Brian Hook and a few others. I don't know if that's what they're referring to. Um, I'm not really sure, though. Uh, but it, it, anyway, it, it, I think the answer. I'm not yeah. sure what it is, but whatever it is, I haven't heard anything about that to suggest that anything, you know, what we're seeing now with regard to momentum or lack thereof has to do with, with that. I think the IRGC has proponents. If you look at the, if you look at IRGC news outlets, people who are voicing the opinions of different parts of the IRGC, um, there's a healthy debate going on right now. And they're debating amongst themselves what kind of a deal is good for us? When should we take it? Some are radical and saying we should oppose it all together until the U.S. comes on their hands and knees. But but there is a healthy debate out there. I don't. I, I wouldn't overstate the importance of those types of dynamics between one U.S. official and what he wrote in his book or what he might have said. I, that that's my opinion. Right. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, obviously, John Bolton, National Security Advisor under President Trump. A, a extremely vocal opponent of JCPOA and uh, essentially a hardliner on uh, Iran's uh, nuclear program. Um, okay, so uh, Tisha, uh, you have a few questions there. Uh, let me offer this for you. Um, if you would uh, please uh, have your son communicate with me, M-A-R-D at J-H-U dot E-D-U, I'll be happy to answer any questions that he might have about the program. M A R D at J H U dot edu. Uh, as for your question on Iran and religion, um, Scott, as a as a Iran watcher, how do we uh, factor religion into the bigger scheme of re uh, regime motivation and legitimacy, and how we deal with it uh, from a Western perspective? I think there's a, I, I, as long as I, I, I think if you re, if you look at this latest, we'll call it this latest experiment at the top of the Iranian regime, the Raisi, we'll call it the Raisi administration. The Raisi administration has been billed inside of Iran as 
a revolutionary reset of sorts, you know, trying to actually move away from Rouhani, not that Rouhani, his predecessor, was a reformist by any means, but he was a pragmatist and he had sort of a, a, a pretty good, I thought, balanced approach to opening and reformist ideas along with traditional uh, Islamic, uh, ideo Islamic Republic ideology. They're trying to move away from that. They're trying to make the case that by, by having a, a much more religiously focused, ideologically focused uh, group of people running all dimensions of the government, elected and unelected, that it's going to set Iran finally, once and for all, deal or no deal on the right course. So they want to show the Iranians and the world that religion and what inspired the Islamic revolution in the first place is what's going to purify the country. It's going to reduce corruption. It's going to get the population in line. It's going to get people excited again about the Islamic Republic. It's going to streamline the bureaucracy. It's going to do all these great things. Unfortunately, a year in, we haven't, we haven't really seen any of those things come to fruition. And in fact, the criticism is piling up against, against Rouhani. So I think it's important. I think it, they're hanging on to it because they have to. But I think if you talk to people who, who say, listen, if there are somewhat reasonably trustworthy polls in Iran, and those are hard to come by, on how much do you think religion should, should be involved in politics? How much do you, Iranian citizen, you know, how much do you focus on religion as part of your life and your outlook? I think it's shrunk considerably over time. I mean, it just gets lower and lower and lower, and which is why there's such a the distance growing between the ordinary Iranian person and the mindset that they have and the Iranian regime and its desire to hold on to these traditional 1979 Khomeinist Islamic principles is growing over time. But we have to recognize, though, that all these demands we put on the Iranians, right, um, they're, th that the regime, as long as it's there, I don't think they're going to abandon it. I don't think they're going to soften their approach. And I think religion is going to be at the center of it. Look at Friday prayer leaders who have all been there and the new ones that have been installed. If you look at people across the government, people who are running things and the ones who are going to be instrumental in a transition, succession, the real centers of power there, they all use, they all fall back on these same religious themes. So I don't think it's going away. I think it's important. We have to recognize that it's not. And I think particularly at a time when Iran says, wait a minute, the U.S. finally is backing out of the region. That's great. That's a big victory for us. Now we have to, con now we have to contend with the likes of more aggressive, uh, externalizing Saudi ambitions, externalizing Emirati ambitions, Egyptians, Lib whoever you want to call it, Israeli and others. It, there's no more important time for us now than to go back and recall the roots of this revolution and to understand why we've been trying to externalize it. Mm -hmm. Successes, failures aside, we need to continue to embrace what we came, what, we, what sort of originated this government, this movement. Um, yeah, follow up. In fact, Justice Department had charged an individual oh, know, connected well, with the IRGC or with uh, an attempt to uh, uh, a plot to assassinate uh, former. Uh, NSA uh, uh, John Bolton. So we'll see what happens with yeah. uh, how that plays out. Thank you for that. And um, lastly, um, there was a quite, we had a question earlier on on Iran oil. Uh, what kind of oil do they produce? What do they uh, what do they export? Um, are they uh, is this a value? How um, value excuse me valuable a commodity is in uh, the international marketplace? It's a great, no, it's a great question. <clears throat> they've, got, they've got different blends that they, that they produce, heavy and medium blends of oil. They've got condensate, lighter condensate that they, that they ship out. If you think that they're, we think that they're probably around 2.5 million barrels a day right now, uh, and that includes production, domestic consumption, and exports. They're, when they're going full speed ahead with no sanctions, no, nothing offline at all, they're around 3.8. So call the disruption right now of Iranian oil to the, something to the tune of 1.2, 1.3 million barrels a day. That's a lot, especially at these prices. That's a significant amount. And I go back to my earlier comment. Right now, Biden goes, Biden went last, uh, 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 recently went and went so, and he had to do the, the fist bump with, with MBS and he had to, to, um, to do uh, the unimaginable for him, which was to go and meet with MBS and acknowledge MBS after everything he said he wasn't gonna do, largely because he, need, he said, we need the Saudis to produce more oil. We need them, we need OPEC plus to take action. One of the things that I think this administration has learned, okay, and there really are only a few people like Amos Hochstein, the special advisor on energy, that really understand oil markets there, that aren't just focused on climate and the transition, and, um, is that 
uh, spare, spare production capacity really matters. And when you look at global demand, global, the overall global demand for global energy, and you look at what the world, what global suppliers like the Saudis and the Emiratis and the arguably Kuwait and Iraq on a much smaller level, what they hold in, in spare production capacity that they intentionally keep offline, that they can bring back or, or take, take on, that they can bring on and off. It's very small. You're talking about the estimates range from two to three million barrels a day. It's not that much. That's two to three percent at the most of total global oil demand. That's, in historical terms, it's extremely low. So the market knows that. And the market says, wait a minute, the Saudis are producing at 10.8 10, 10, 10 million barrels a day right now. They only committed to go up by 100, they, 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 by a very, very minute amount in this recent meeting with Biden because they can't go much higher. They know it. And I think the Biden administration is realizing we've got to take the little incremental things that we can get. That's why, going back to the question, the, the potential return of over a million barrels a day of Iranian oil is extremely important to stabilizing oil prices, to reducing oil prices and stabilizing the market. The Saudis know that, they recognize it. And to give you a sense of how important it is, um, the people, we get questions all the time about how fast can the Iranian oil come back? Is this Venezuela or is this Libya? Or it's war torn and it, the, the infrastructure has been eroded over time because these barrels have been disrupted for so long. Not what we're hearing. If there's a deal tomorrow, there's going to be an implementation phase of the deal, two to three months like there was last time. But they've got, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 or more million barrels sitting in onshore and floating storage that they will start releasing right away. That will put for down that will put more oil, more oil on the market, downward pressure on prices. But that additional million or so uh, of, of Iranian production is going to have a real impact. It's really important. And I think everybody's watching it. Within six to nine months, that oil could come back onto the market. So yeah, it's, it's important, it's there, it's needed, everybody wants it. And, and again, I think even the Saudis, you would normally think their knee-jerk reaction would be, we wanna grind Iran into the dust, we wanna keep them from bringing that oil out on the market. On some level, the Saudis know that they, they can't carry this alone. They can't put out all of these fires. If you have Libya go offline, which could happen anytime, if you have other problems, if you have regional war, they're, they're not going to be able to stop the price of oil going up to 200 or higher and then have collapsed. They don't want that type of volatility. So Iran, in a sense, brings stability that even their enemies, the Saudis, see logic to. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that, Scott. Uh, and thanks for uh, this great overview, your insights on Iran and the region, very valued. And also to our uh, watchers today for your questions. Thank you for your participation. If there's any uh, questions that you have uh, for us, let, let get in touch. Any questions about our uh, program here, uh, Master of Science and Intelligence Analysis, reach out to me, uh, uh, mard at uh, jhu.edu, or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, Scott, I'd love to have you back soon. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to be updating this story pretty soon. Uh, and uh, we'll probably do it again in 2024, That's right. 25. Yeah. It'll never, it's the never ending tale. All right. It is. It and, is uh, say, and also say hi to our friends over at uh, Rapid Energy Group while you're at. I will. Thanks for having me. And again, I would encourage uh, you know to stay in touch. And anybody, if there's if there are other people that want to get in touch and talk CIA and energy or anything else, feel free to uh, connect me with people who are, who are interested in those types of things. Of course. Happy to be Thank here. You. Thank you.